Welcome to Page One, the show for writers with the reader in mind. Here's your host, Zeta Christian. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Page One. I'm Zeta Christian. My guest tonight is a true Renaissance woman. She is a writer, the author of adult books and children's books. She is an accomplished musician. She is a calligrapher. She is an artist. And she's a good friend of mine from the International Women's Writing Guild. She came up from New York to be with us tonight. Please welcome Mingmei Yip. Mingmei, thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for having me, Sita. Th this is exciting. I know we've wanted to do this for quite a while, uh, from when the first book came out, but mm -hmm. at least now with the second book yeah. out, we finally get you up mm -hmm. here and, and we'll talk about this. So let's jump right in. I want to talk mm -hmm. about the second book, okay. the the latest book that is uh, that is just out on the shelves now, um, Petals from the Sky. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little about what the book's about. Um, actually, um, I'll talk about the um, latest book first, Petals from the Sky. The storyline is about a young Chinese woman who wants to be, who wants to run away from her uh, dysfunctional family to become a Buddhist nun. And finally, she realized actually she has been running away from her own heart. Uh -huh. And I have to tell you that actually, this point and compelling love story is partly based of, on my own life. You know, Ming Mei, I'm glad you said that because I, I am convinced that as writers, whether we recognize it or not, <laughs> we do write about our lives. Mm -hmm. And it's refreshing to have an author come right out and say, yes, some of this story. Uh, is based on my own life. So, so tell me the, what's, what's fact and, and what's fiction. What, what part of the story mirrors your own life? Um, a lot of monologue, of course, actually just um, reflects my own thinking. Mm -hmm. And I befriended um, Buddhist nuns, actually very powerful Buddhist nuns in Hong Kong in my youth. And um, actually I was deemed um, a very ideal successor to a temple in Hong Kong. I think it's because of my background, because um, I was trained in the four Chinese literary arts, music, painting, calligraphy, and poetry. And also later, because I got my PhD, um, that's why I was deemed you know, very you know, <laughs> ideal. So the, the PhD was in musicology? Musicology. Um, in my mentor actually herself is a very accomplished artist herself. But she just liked people in the arts to, you know, to be uh, one of the nuns. <laughs> okay, so the nuns were recruiting you. I wouldn't say recruit. I mean, it's not okay. official. Maybe lure, seduce, more than recruit. Okay. Yeah, yeah the because power of the word. <laughs> yeah, and um, I want to say actually there are two kinds of nuns. Okay. One, as we all know, they meditate. You know, they live a very solitary life. You know, in meditation. You know, in, high up in the mountains. But actually. There are totally a different kind. Actually, they really we call it the entering the world nun or entering the world monks. That means they actually socialize. They hop not with politicians, you know, celebrities and everything because they get huge amount of donation. That's why they can do a lot of charity works. And that's so why I, your work in the arts would have been so <laughs> valuable. <laughs> yeah, and that's why actually that's the that kind of nuns that I kind of befriended in my youth. Okay, so so this book about the the woman who is she's going to become a nun, or mm -hmm. so she, so she thinks to escape a dysfunctional family. Okay, uh -huh. <laughs> you know the first part. Okay, to escape, escaping a dysfunctional family. Okay, I'm sure there are a lot of people in the audience going, "Yes, I can mm -hmm. certainly relate to that." I don't know how many would mm -hmm. would choose to become a Buddhist nun as mm -hmm. the way out, but it, mm -hmm. it works for this story and in this culture. Mm -hmm. And in the story, your heroine goes to a Buddhist retreat. Um, I remember the scene where she suddenly realizes she doesn't have the money that yeah. she's supposed to have, uh -huh. and this man steps up and offers to uh -huh. to to learn, loan her the money. Any truth to that in, in real life? <laughs> um, not really. Okay. <laughs> that one, yeah. Well, and that's part of the idea. I mean, you know, we we start from something, start from a spark. But um, the dysfunctional family actress is is real. That one, the mm -hmm. the mother character, the father character, those actually are real. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, based on my. <laughs> Parents. <laughs> okay. Yeah. L let me ask you something. Uh, are your parents still living? 
Unfortunately not, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, w I wondered about that because um, I know a lot of writers who talk about either writing memoir, which would be directly, mm -hmm. you know, based on memories and, and family members in many cases, but even in fiction, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. where, we, where we consciously are basing a character mm -hmm. on a family member and it just, well, it just feels more comfortable mm -hmm. to... To oh, even if past. my parents are still alive, I feel very comfortable writing about them. Good. I don't think they might at all either. Good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. They are they're very rich characters. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you also about the, the names of the characters mm -hmm. uh, in your book. I found that fascinating. Mm -hmm. I mean, one character who, whose name is Depending on Emptiness. Yeah, I like that one too myself. Is, and, and another one whose name is No Name. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and is that are those actual names or are the These actual are all types real of names. names? But these real names, it doesn't mean that it's just limited to one person. These kind of names can be given to um, different nuns and monks, but they are all real names. Like you know, detached from the dust, that's a real name too. Detached so, from the dust. Dust meaning actually the world they're living in, because you know oh. we return to dust, oh, so okay. it's detached from dust. Um, they have all these very philosophical, thought-provoking names, which I really love. They're yeah, beautiful. no name is a real name. Yeah, dependent on emptiness. Um, Do people pick their own name, or does someone give them? No, the name? Um, because when you ordained as nuns or monks, your mentor or the head nun or monk, they they give you the name. Oh. Yeah. What, if, what if you don't like the name? I don't think you have a choice. <laughs> choice. And you have to be detached if you're a nun. Of course. <laughs> yes. You'll be detached from the name. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You shouldn't be so, you know, I want this name. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I, I love about your story, well, well, first let's, let's give a little categorization. The books are published by Kensington. And I would say your books, while they have a strong romantic mm -hmm. content, I see them more as mainstream women's fiction, the larger canvas, mm -hmm. um, but definitely have a, a beautiful love story that runs throughout. Would, would you agree? Am I assessing correctly? Completely agree. Actually, Kensington categorizes it um, in mainstream literary fiction or sometimes women's fiction, but um, like with a strong romantic element, because I always like to include a love story. Oh, yeah. Because I, I think love is the most powerful emotion in the world. Yeah. So actually in my novel, I use this love story actually to kind of um, express some kind of um, philosophy in life. Like we have to be, have compassion, we have to have wisdom, we have to detach at the right time, and we have to pursue something at the right time. So I want to use love story to actually convey all these different kind of Conf uh, I mean, philosophies in life. I think that's very wise, not, and, and you do it well, and I also think because of that, I mean, the relationships, we all, we all have relationships yeah. in our lives, or mm -hmm. we, we wish for mm -hmm. a, additional relationships in our lives. So absolutely, very, very powerful. Um, one of the things I particularly like mm -hmm. about your writing, and that's one of the things I want to talk about tonight, Ming Mei, because the show is page one. I have a lot of viewers who mm -hmm. are writers. I hear from them all the time. Mm -hmm. You have, you have details in your book mm -hmm. that I think are evocative, um, exquisite, and, and in many <laughs> cases unusual. And perhaps that's because I know very little about the Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. So I read along and I think, ooh, what a beautiful way to phrase something. You, you had something in, um, in Petals from the Sky where you referred to a vegetarian vegetarian dishes mm -hmm. as having a, a widow's taste. Yeah. <laughs> and I assume because there were not the funds for, for me. Yes, yeah, it's not fun. And also because it's, it's as if your taste bud is lost, just like, you know, a widow lost their loved ones. You know, that's ah. why, yeah, that's the widow's taste. It's beautiful, just beautiful. So to get a little bit more of that flavor, if you would pick up that copy of your book over there, mm -hmm. and, and if you'll see, I put a little yellow tag there mm -hmm. um, on, I believe it's about page 15. If you would, yeah, okay. Um, no, this one right up here. Mm -hmm. There we go. If you would just read that page for us, it'll give us a flavor for the book, but also particularly for these details. Okay. So I'm going to read this. Um, uh, the chapter is called to Accumulate More Merit. Okay, where's chapter we, three? We have to generate good karmas in life. Yes, That's we do. That's uh, one of the Buddhist wisdoms. Okay. Now inside the lobby of the Fragrant Spirit Temple, 
The line continued to move slowly, and people were fidgeting, or fidgeting. Um, and we are listening to the electronic Buddhist music. The incantation of great compassion boomed from every corner of the monastery. Because I had been too poor to afford it in the past, this was the first time I had joined a retreat. I had little money, but I thought that at thirty it was now or never. So I pay with the money I've saved during my five years of study in Paris, as a scholarship student, and by doing odd jobs, assisting part time in a small art gallery, sketching portraits for fee throng, each in Montmartre, and waitressing. The temple quickly filled up with people of all ages, including quite a number of children. Some were sitting, others strutting along around in the little black robes, their oversized sleeves trailing on the floor, making dry brushing sounds. A few of the boys exhibited cleanly shaved heads. Their pale scalps looked like strangely enlarged eggs under the hot July sun. Groups of men talked animatedly while waiting. I wondered what they were talking about: Buddhism or the stock market. Women whispered and giggled. Were they comparing the charitable deeds of the Goddess of Mercy to those of Princess Diana? Thank you. You know that I, I love the line in there about because of the shaved heads, mm -hmm. the, the their heads looking like oversized like lot, eggs. Yeah, and eggs. I could picture the long, and I could hear the long <laughs> sleeves. Brushing against the ground, mm -hmm. just, just beautiful detail. You you mentioned a little bit earlier, Ming Mei, um, that the characters, the parents in the story, mm -hmm. were very much a reflection of mm -hmm. your own life, and the mother in the story is quite the character. So um, I'm going to ask you to take that book one more time, okay. and because this is page one, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to read page one from the story. I often find it of value to writers to hear how much information, whether it's background or setting or characterization, what, what was your choice as an author to put into that first page? Um, I think to start the story, um, people said that you better start right in the middle. Mm -hmm. So I think this is very exciting because when she was 20 and she, died, she decided to be a Buddhist nun. And of course, it's a big, big transition in your life if you really want to be a Buddhist nun. Oh, sure. So I think there's a good conflict here. So she's talking with the mother, and this, I think it's a lot of humor too. I think in this so first, too. Yeah, yeah, page. Okay. Okay. Mother choked and spilled her tea. Ah, yeah. What evil person has planted this crazy idea into your head? I was twenty, and has just told her my wish to become a Buddhist nun. She stooped to wipe the stain from, her, from the floor, her waist disappearing into the fold of flesh around her middle. Remember the daughter of your great-great-grandfather who entered the nunnery because she was duped by her fiancé? She had no face left. She has no name, no friends, no hair. She just whole day like a statue. The only difference was she had a cushion to sit on, and she called that meditation. Mother looked me in the eyes. Is that the life you want? No freedom, no love, no meat? Before I could respond, she plunged on, Ming Ning. There are only three reasons a girl wants to become a nun. Before she meets the right man. After she has met the wrong one. Or worse, after the right one has turned into the wrong one. Mother clacked her tongue and added, Not until after you taste love, real love, then tell me again you want to be a nun. That had been ten years ago, but my wish to be a nun had not faltered. Not until 1987, on a hot summer day in a Buddhist retreat in Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you. I love the mother in that book. And I can see, I mean, I can certainly see from mm -hmm. the mother's perspective. I don't want my, my daughter to become a nun. <laughs> um, I mean, f yes, she, she's saying to the daughter, I want you to experience love. I want, but she's also speaking as a grandmother. Mm -hmm. It's like... Where my grandchildren, mm -hmm. you know, if, yeah, if yeah, you become she's a nun, I mean, she won't have any offsprings. Absolutely. So, um, let me turn for a minute now to your first book, the um, the first book, which um, this one over here, Peach Blossom Pavilion. Now, where where the book that's that's out now is a contemporary novel. Peach Blossom Pavilion is a historical, historical novel, correct? Yeah. And what is that one about? 
Actually, I think both of my novels are first of its kind in English language because this one, like Buddhist, Buddhist nun, actually a lot of my friends when I told them, oh, Buddhism has nuns. Oh. They don't even know that you know, there are Buddhist nuns at all. And I think this is the first one about this kind of nuns. Of course, it's not the first one about nuns, but the first one about this kind, as I refer to business nuns, yes. you know, they're really, really powerful. They are multimillionaire or the billionaire. I mean, they're not like the nuns, what we think. And Peach Blossom Pavilion is also first of its kind because it's most of my American friends, or most of the Americans I talk with, they all heard of the Japanese geisha, needless to say. Sure. Yeah. And they never heard of Chinese geisha. Only Chinese has geisha also. I mean, they don't know about it. And actually, Chinese geisha exists in history 2,500 years ago. Long, long time. Oh. 2,500, not, you know. Um, actually, the reason I wrote this book is because since I played the instrument, the, the, the chin, you know, the seven string sitter, and I did a lot of research, and I found that actually, besides what we call the gentry women, you know, like myself, mm -hmm. who, who um, you know, are trained in this for literally us, actually the geisha or the courtesan, you know, they also trained to play this instrument. So after that, I, you know, I'm extremely interested in their life and their fascinated life, the beautiful, elegant, talented woman, but somehow because of the twist of fate, cruelty of fate, they end up in a prostitution house. So it is prostitution. Yeah. It is, but, but it has class. a fancy name. High Curtis class. Curtis 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 and actually, Peach Blossom Pavilion is the name of a prostitution house. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted yeah. to ask you about that. So there's significance <laughs> yeah. in the name. Yeah. And uh, so this is also the first time in English language is about Chinese geisha. First time. Yeah. But this is a very different, you know, from this one. This is a very sexy one. A very sexy novel. Okay. This is sexy, but in a different way because it's a suppressed kind of, you know, desire. Okay. But this one is... It's different. Now, do people think that this one is your life also? <laughs> actually, a good question. Yes, actually. I kind of wonder. One of my, <laughs> you mean? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, one of my writers group, yes. and actually um, the friend of mine, it's not like a personal friend, so she doesn't know about me, just through the writing writers group. After she read this one, and then she said, is it about, I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> you? I said, no. And then she said, your mother? And I said, no. Your grandmother? That has to be your aunt. Something Wait. like this, because I think it's so real. It's well, so real. Yes. So they think it has to be someone related to you. But I also think, you know, because in that story, your, your heroine plays that instrument, mm -hmm. the seven strings <laughs> yeah, of the, the chin. In fact, um, let me just say for those of you, I mean, we're watching page one now, so I'm, I'm talking with Ming Mei Yip, and we're talking about her writing and about her books, but we're also going to have Ming Mei as a guest on our sister show, Full Bloom, where she is going to talk about that instrument, that ancient Chinese instrument called the chin, and she will not only talk about it, but she's going to play it. So do join us uh, for that show on, on another night. But I, getting back to the, the book, I can see where to include something that is so unusual, the mastery of this ancient mm -hmm. instrument, I can see where someone might say, you must have a personal connection to the, <laughs> to the story to have that so true. But these women, be, um, besides they were trained in the four literally arts that I mentioned already, they're also trained in witty conversations. That means they can talk with you hours and hours and make you laugh, they make you cry, they make you that you're not sure you want to cry or you want to laugh. So they're, they're really very attractive women. And because men are bored, you know, <laughs> so they sometimes like to, you know, talk with these women. They write poetry, of course. Oh. They correspond with the scholars, the poems. I read the poems passed down from 1,000 years ago. I did a lot of research on this one. I saw the paintings, you know, and everything. Fascinating lives, tragic lives. And I, what I really admire about these women is because their life is, you know, was so bad, but they were able to rise above and some one even actually married an ambassador so she became an ambassador, ambassador's wife in Germany oh my. and of course the final ultimate thing they had to be trained is the art of the bed chamber that's the ultimate well of course I mean, yeah. it could be a geisha or a courtesan <laughs> yeah. I mean the, um, the yeah, sexual pleasure a is, a, is a fascinating component. life yeah
Okay. Some were magicians and some were also, um, what do you call it, um, like gymnasts. They have to walk on tight ropes suspended in there. Oh. But the thing is, people watch, you know, people watch them. But, of course, it, there were no safety net in, in, in ancient China at all. Not only that, mm -hmm. and the people put sharpened salt facing them so in, to ensure the death in case they, in case they fell. Oh, Ming Mei. Yeah, and, and it's very, you know, this kind of life that they, they have to fall? endure. Did no, some fall? because that means you have to be so good. Well, and sure, you have to be that good. Yeah, so, I bet. No, they didn't fall. <laughs> good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the book that's in process now, the, the one you're working on. Actually, I just finished my third novel, and I think it will come out next year. In it's 2011. Called yeah, okay. it's called Song, Song of the Silk Road. Song of the Silk Road. Yeah, and this one actually is about uh, old, an older woman. Not that much older, but she's like 29 with a younger man. The, young, the How man much younger? is 21. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and it's a love story. It's a very sexy one too, this one. But also my, my, uh, my novel always used a love story to review something else. So actually this set along the famous Silk Road the very dangerous Silk Road in China. And Silk Road is the ancient route, you know, where, where China, you know, uh, export silk to the West, to the Middle East and mm -hmm. all the way to, to, to Rome. Yeah. So it's an a adventure story along this Silk Road and love story too. And um, so this one actually is, is uh, very exciting for me. For me to write about because this woman actually she attract danger because she's an adventurer herself. So she attract oh. danger as much as she attracts men, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> like bees to honey because ah, of her personality. Okay. So and um, also because um, the main character besides all uh, many many adventures in the novel, you know different characters like fortune teller, herbalist who collect herbs from the highest mountain you know in China. And also another character is the desert itself is a character. And the desert uh, is called the Taklamakan Desert. Um, and what does that word mean? It means go out but never come, go in but never come out. Ooh. So you can imagine the ooh, danger. Oh, the along. foreboding, sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I have to tell you, Manchester, you know, where we're taping, mm -hmm. Was uh, is is also known as Silk City. Mm -hmm. oh. um, and and mm -hmm. we have the uh, the the Chini family were. Um, they made a lot of silk here in the, in the mm -hmm, 1800s, mm -hmm, a mm -hmm. lot of the mills here. So mm -hmm. we'll have to have you back when that book comes out and, and get put you in <laughs> contact you. with our historical mm -hmm. society. That mm -hmm. would be fascinating. So um, in addition to that, to the books for adults, mm -hmm. you've also written a children's book. And I know you have um, one that you're also working on. But yeah. the one that we have here with us tonight, uh, that children's book, tell us a little bit about what that is about. It's, it's a collection, correct? Yeah, actually, the first one, um, Chinese children's favorite stories. There are altogether 13 traditional Chinese stories retold by me. And I also did the illustrations. And there are 64 color illustrations uh, in the book. And I retold the story, meaning that actually um, some story, let's say a very famous one called The Dream of the Butterfly. Actually, this is a story a very philosoph philosophical story for adults, but I kind of make it so children can also understand. It's very philosophical yeah, cool. because a scholar, he was a scholar, he fell asleep, and he dreamed of a butterfly. But the dream, but the dream was so real. So he, when he woke up, he said, maybe actually I was a butterfly dreaming that I was a scholar. So it's a very philosophical. Maybe the other way around, but I'm not sure. Well, Who that's knows? part of the, you know, <laughs> that 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 concept is key in that the the late the movie that's so popular right now, Avatar. You know, what parts the oh, dream and what part that. is reality? Yeah, is it? Oh, I just yeah. saw it. It was beautiful. And that story was 2,500 years old story, mm. and actually the actual text only two lines. So I expanded the whole story with conversation and everything, you know, to be a story for children. But it's not just a story for children. It's a story for children that preserves something about Chinese culture and yeah. stories. So it's all, you know, it's a very good book to learn about Chinese culture because it's all traditional stories retold by me. I find it unusual that you were allowed also to do the illustrations. Most times the... It's actually, it's luck for this one. Good. It's luck. Actually, they asked me to do the writing first. And then somehow um, the editor told me he couldn't work with the writer because it's too arrogant. <laughs> 
So he just, oh, uh, I mean, she asked me to do illustrations first. I mean, the other way oh. around, I'm sorry. Yeah. And then um, she asked me whether I know someone else who can you know, do the writing. I said, I'm a writer. Excuse me, I can do <laughs> yeah. that, sure. So that's why I get both. It's, oh. it's very, very difficult because normally they don't want you to do both. Right. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I mean, really a stroke of luck this, and this time. How yeah. fortunate. Yeah, uh, it is. And, and really. I think so unusual, I mean, to, to start off as the illustrator yeah. and also be the Because writer. the editor uh, knew me as an illustrator first. I see. He, she didn't know that I'm a writer. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I look at all of this, Ming Mei, and mm -hmm. I'm thinking, okay, adult novels, children's books. I know that you just finished some work on a children's musical. Yeah. <laughs> based on one of the stories yeah. in the book. And I know you do a lot of self-promotion. Mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of book tours. Mm -hmm. I know just just recently, let me see if I can get the camera on this here. Um, this is a poster from an evening where you played that ancient instrument at Carnegie Hall. And calligraphy too. Uh, and, and, the, and the calligraphy. calligraphy. Yeah. So um, you have, you truly are a Renaissance woman. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and let me also just mention too, right here, we have some of your some of your illustrations. This is a, mm -hmm. an image of the goddess of inspiration, which is, is beautiful. So what I want to know is, what kind of schedule do you keep? I mean, <laughs> how do you do this? Um, of course, I mean, I work hard, yes. <laughs> as everybody does, actually. And... Um, I remember, I, I think it's Woody Allen, but I'm not sure. He said, you know, 95% of success is just showing up. Just showing up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, there was a very famous Chinese painter who said something very similar. He said, you want to be a great painter, just never put down your brush. That means you just have to do it every day, every minute. Yes. So it's very similar. And uh, I also, I need to read a lot. And I also call another Chinese, famous Chinese uh, poet, you know, like over a thousand years ago, he said that if you read over 10,000 books, then your writing will be like added by the gods. That uh, means you have to read so much that you have so many things inside you. Sure, yeah. you mm -hmm. fill that creative well. Mm -hmm. Well, Ming Mei, thanks very much for Thank coming you, tonight. For I know it was me. a trip mm -hmm. from New York to be here mm -hmm. with us, and I really appreciate it. And the fact that you shared content from some of your books, I think that that's, that's very valuable. So, um, let me just close by reminding everyone, especially those of you in the audience who are also writers, let me just uh, quote another famous author, Ursula Le Guin, who said, there have been civilizations that did not use the wheel, but there have been no civilizations that did not tell stories. So find your story and find a way to tell it, and do join us again next time. Thank you. Food for the crew and guests was provided by Manchester Grill of Manchester, Connecticut and Angelo's Restaurant of Glastonbury, Connecticut. Be sure to send your writing questions and your comments on the book club selection to Zeta at page 1, P.O. Box 1515, Manchester, Connecticut, 06045-1515 or send an email to zeta at page1tv.com.